OK, well, let's uh, let's make a start. So it's now seven o'clock. Good evening, everybody. And hopefully you can hear me OK. I'm Julian Mays. I'm secretary of the history group and uh, I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome to this evening's meeting. So I'm going to just share my screen now just to give us the uh, title slide for this evening. And uh, we're delighted to welcome Martin Young, former chief forecaster at the Met Office, to uh, review changes in weather forecasting through his career and perhaps a little longer. Um, and I'm sure um, we'll we'll enjoy listening to Martin in the next hour or so. I've just got one or two slides to start things off. Um, so uh, just assuming you can all uh, you're you're seeing the slides. OK, Martin, if you can just give me a thumbs up that you're seeing the shared slides. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, well, this is actually the third virtual meeting of the history group, obviously a response to uh, the pandemic. And we started these last summer and we will have a few more to come as well. So for those of you who are not yet a member of the history group, notice I said yet, um, uh, welcome to the history group. Um, we actually were formed back in 1983, so we're one of the longest running special interest groups of the society. And of our various activities, one that has continued through the pandemic is the issue of the newsletter two or three times a year. Um, I uh, collate the newsletter and uh, we, we keep things going, keep our members um, up to date through that. And uh, Howard Oliver, who joins us this evening, uh, edits um, the occasional papers series, which is for longer uh, research studies. I'd just like to mention for a few moments before I hand over to Martin, the fact that the uh, group formed in 1983, I uh, was reminded of one of the early goals of the group, which was to collate the memories of weather forecasters who had served in the Second World War. And it occurred to me that when the group was started, it was only 40 years on from the Second World War itself. Now, uh, for those of us who can remember the early 1980s, um, this comparison certainly may make us feel rather old tonight because not only is Martin going to be going back about 40 or 50 years um, looking at how weather forecasting has changed in that time, um, it's uh, it also takes us back to about the time the group was formed. But it's sobering to think perhaps when they looked back 40 years, um, that was back to the Second World War. And of course, it was it was a case of capturing those memories uh, while we still could, while we still could talk to those people who were involved at that time. So that's one of the things the history group started on and ended up in, at the end of the 1980s running two conferences um, just on that theme of the weather and the Second World War. So there's nothing unusual just to be looking back um, a mere 40 or 50 years and uh, we can judge tonight how much weather forecasting has changed in that time. Now, the obligatory plug for the history group continues. Membership is free. I keep uh, a, uh, a, a mailing list of uh, members email addresses to which I uh, send the newsletter and we give uh, information on our web page. We do have an archive of newsletters, uh, but not not quite as um, recently updated as uh, as the members receive. And if I have tempted any of you to join the history group, um, that's the email address to contact me on. And I'll be very pleased to add you to the list of members. OK. Um, in theory, you're all members of the Royal Met Society um, and of course everybody's welcome to these meetings. I think tonight the vast majority of our guests are society members, so you'll be well aware of the benefits of membership, but this is really the, the way into special interest groups such as the History Group and notably Weather Magazine, of course, um, perhaps the first one of the first uh, benefits we think of. And I do think of the current issue, which features an article from from Martin uh, contributing, uh, con continuing his run of uh, contributions to uh, weather. 
So I'm suspecting whilst many of you may not yet be a member of the history group, you're, you're well aware of the society as a whole. Uh, I would like to thank, though, at this point, uh, Catherine Bicknell and Ke Kelly Fletcher for not only being on hand at the moment, for, but for giving us a lot of assistance over the last few days behind the scenes. Very quickly, before I um, hand over to Martin, we've got the chat area at the top of the screen. Um, I think it's the second button from the left in Teams where you can just lodge questions there. Uh, we may end up with quite a lot of questions tonight with a good turnout. Um, and so we would say, could the questions be relevant to the, the topic? And also, we may not be able to answer all of them. We'll try to group them together if several of you ask a similar question. And as I say, if there's an overflow discussion uh, needed, the I'm very happy to offer the uh, History Group newsletter for that uh, purpose. There we are. Um, so I shall stop sharing uh, my screen now and hand over in a moment to Martin. I should give Martin his uh, the full introduction though before I uh, move on. Um, Martin's career will be obvious uh, from what he says tonight, um, but if not, he wrote about it and all his recollections in the May 2021 issue of Weather. But I also think this evening of all the articles that Martin has contributed to Weather over the years, case studies of extreme weather events, and also something that was very useful for me when I went into weather forecasting mid-career. Martin was co-author of Images in Weather Forecasting, uh, published in 1995, and as Martin said in his article last year, it's still very relevant today. So on that note, I shall, um, I think I've stopped sharing now, Martin, so you should be able to um, okay. share your content and I'll hand over to you. OK, can you see the uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, that looks fine. OK, right. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Julian, for inviting me to uh, speak to the history group tonight uh, about a subject which I've become increasingly interested in recent years. Uh, my background has been some 40 years at the Met Office, uh, much of which was spent in operational forecasting as well as uh, research. And uh, this study has been prompted to some extent by how much I had to adapt my own uh, skill sets during my career, um, not without some difficulty, it must be said. Uh, now, it's been said that the development, for example, of NWP has been one of humanity's greatest scientific achievements. Uh, but whilst much has been written about uh, NWP, how NWP has advanced uh, since the advent of the computer in the 1940s, uh, very little has been written about how the uh, role of the operational forecaster has changed in tandem with progress in NWP and uh, technology. So I'm going to show how the working practices of, of forecasters have markedly um, um, have markedly changed since the pre-computer era, but the role is just as important in the current day as it um, um, as it was then. So I'm going to focus on the period really a bit longer than Julian mentioned, because back to the uh, uh, end of the Second World War, largely from the perspective of uh, the UK central guidance forecaster, in other words, the uh, um, senior forecaster at, um, uh, at the Met Office headquarters, and this is because it kind of reflects my my own experience and areas of interest. But um, uh, nevertheless, I think this presentation will be relevant to uh, uh, many other forecasting specialities in uh, in a variety of organisations. So uh, I'll illustrate key developments with um, relevant examples, primarily focusing on the short and medium range forecasting uh, um, period. And um, this study will actually form the basis of a series of papers that I'm uh, co-authoring with uh, Nick Graham uh, to appear eventually in the uh, in weather. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress, and so I welcome any uh, um, any feedback that um, uh, that you may have. I'd like to thank um, Mark Bezik uh, in the National Met Archives for making a lot of uh, information available, which I some of which I used in this using in this presentation. So um, perhaps the most 
famous forecast ever was that provided to the uh, Allied commanders leading up to the D-Day landings of June 1944. It was because of forecasts uh, um, that the invasion was postponed for 24 hours um, uh, because of uh, expected poor weather conditions in the Channel. Uh, the invasion did go ahead 24 hours later uh, when the forecasts were suggesting a marked improvement in cloud and visibility uh, following the clearance of this uh, cold front. And uh, notwithstanding arguments have been subsequently about the accuracy of the forecasts, uh, doubtless the forecasts played, forecasters played a crucial role in an event that uh, um, essentially changed the course of history. Now, at that time, in the middle of last century, forecasting was still a very, quite a rudimentary, uh, um, in a rudimentary state and relied very heavily on uh, relating um, actual and forecast pressure patterns to, um, uh, to commonly observed, ob observed weather associated with particular weather features, such as in this remarkably prescient model by Amb uh, Ab Abercrombie and Marriott in the, in the 1880s. And um, the Norwegian model, uh, frontal model, uh, devised early last century, uh, put uh, put things in a slightly firmer conceptual framework by um, prescribing particular sequences of weather associated with a depression, its fronts and air masses um, um, as the system passed and using forecasters expertise and if you like looking at the current weather situation that faced the forecaster and then seeing how it matched with examples in the past and assuming it would behave in a similar way. But um, there are a lot of additional complications uh, around this basic model, and um, but it's it's a testimony to Berge, to uh, Bjorkney's that this model is still in basically in uh, in use uh, in use to this current day. And around about the same time in the early last century, uh, L. F. Richardson, a, a British mathematician, devised a series of equations which he then to describe the atmosphere, which he then uh, worked through very laboriously manually to produce a six hour forecast for one event, which unfortunately proved very wide of the uh, mark. But um, during the uh, uh, during the intervening years up to the mid 50s, um, much theoretical work was uh, set in train by uh, people such as um, Rosby, Pettersson, Charney and uh, Edie. But um, having said that, um, CKM Douglas, who was a uh, argued by some to be the greatest synoptic forecaster of last century, said that despite the increased scientific understanding, the practical results in forecasting have so far been rather disappointing. So very little progress had been made on actual bench forecasting. Now, during the Second World War, um, upper air observations started to become available. And in, conjunct in tandem with that, um, uh, uh, Sutcliffe, Reginald Sutcliffe, devised his so-called development theory, which used uh, um, uh, commonly observed, pa related commonly observed patterns of thickness, uh, uh, thermal patterns, to likely um, development, cyclonic and anticyclonic developments at the surface. So with the advent of upper air information and these patterns, it at least it means they could be used in a quasi-objective way. Um, for operational uh, synoptic forecasting, you know, for the period uh, up to a day or two ahead. Now, in the uh, mid 1950s, forecasting was uh, very, very much an empirical uh, uh, subject with uh, uh, weather charts, forecast charts produced uh, manually, as in this example taken from the uh, one of the early handbooks of forecasting uh, on the uh, top left here is an analysis of the Atlantic and Europe showing a uh, developing open wave depression to the west of the British Isles. And the 24 hour forecast chart that was produced took this depression curly curving east northeastwards to be near Shetland uh, the next day with the associated cold front uh, clearing rain southeastwards across the country to be followed by this polar maritime air mass bringing uh, implied bringing showers and gales across the north with that next depression off the eastern seaboard 
uh, moving northeastwards following it. And basically, the uh, this chart, this forecast chart, was then used, redrawn for the uh, uh, press weather forecasts and for the television weather forecasts, uh, showing weather symbols or captions in a way that we're very familiar with. Now, um, the forecast has used basically basic continuity there, knowing where the depression had come from, uh, following its movement and then applying rules such as the, uh, based on, for example, the speed of the gradient in the warm sector and advection techniques. But um, the vast majority of situations weren't nice and uh, simple advective like this. They were um, often ill-determinate, uh, complex, and often things could go quite badly wrong within uh, 12 or 24 hours. And also to bear in mind that local forecasters at RF stations, for example, would use these charts and uh, local expertise to determine the sequence of weather at their, at their stations. Now, I was very surprised to find when I looked in archives that uh, medium range forecast charts had actually been produced right back into the pre-computer era. And uh, this example from the uh, January 63 during that uh, mega freeze that took place is an example of a two day manually produced medium range chart um, showing the isobars here, eight millibar intervals, um, the fronts. Notice a lot of rubbing out, obviously, as I would necessarily be in producing this. Plus also in colours, the uh, thickness lines, so uh, uh, which I suspect were there partially in view of the Sutcliffe development ideas. And uh, in this particular forecast chart, it had actually indicated that the intensity of the cold spell would diminish as less cold air came down from the north. So although the overall emphasis was right, there were already major difference errors in detail compared to the analysis chart like this low, instead of dropping down into Scandinavia, dropped right down across uh, Ireland. And by two days time, the pressure was already starting to rise in this huge ridge uh, over Scandinavia. So the pressure was 30 millibars or so higher than the, uh, than the manual forecast. And in fact, the next day, bitterly cold easterlies then returned. Um, so I, I was quite amazed to find this uh, example. But um, in the 1940s, the uh, computer was invented. And so the scene was set for the application of uh, computer models, uh, starting to realise uh, Richardson's vision. Now, computer modelling um, using simple models was going on in several countries. But in the UK, one of the major players was uh, Fred Bushby, pictured here along with Mavis Hines and uh, under the uh, um, supervision as well of John Sawyer. Um, here's an example of the uh, of an early forecast chart. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, an early model forecast chart um, from 1959 uh, um, produced on the uh, probably the Ferranti Meteor computer at Dunstable. Uh, notice that uh, it had produced a, a rep reasonable representation of this low in mid-Atlantic. But downstream, there was a severely and unrealistically distorted pressure pattern towards the British Isles. But uh, work continued and following uh, uh, extensive pre-operational uh, pre trials in the early 1960s, some quite successful results were achieved. Uh, particularly here, this uh, shows a movement of a, uh, of a low pressure up into the UK from the southwest, a complex pattern. And uh, bear in mind, this model didn't have moisture in it at all. And, um, and the, these shaded, the shading represents upward motion at 600 hectopascals. Now, in the um, mid 1960s, in 1965, a new director general took over the meteorological office, as it was called then, uh, Sir jo uh, John Mason. And he was very impressed with some of the early computer predictions and so um, brought forward operational implementation to the 2nd of November 1965. And here's the first operational um, forecast chart re redrawn from computer produced uh, grid point values 300 kilometres apart. This proved in fact to be reasonably reliable, good forecast in quite a simple situation. But um, here is uh, John Mason, a very staged looking picture of him inspecting computer output with uh, white coated scientists standing uh, uh, there. Um, 
the company four catalysts of the time um, often still rejected the, the model's guidance um, uh, because it, it uh, they obviously had ideas as to how uh, we're using their knowledge to decide how systems will behave. But gradually they gained kind of acceptance. And although by the end of the 1970s, the uh, public, there was the perception was that forecasts had barely improved. Um, uh, Mason, in his 1970 Royal Metzok presidential address, said that the introduction of these highly simplified models had introduced much more continuity and consistency in the forecasts than was possible when much depended on the changing roster of forecasters. And I would actually, as an aside, recommend reading his presidential address. It was incredibly prescient. Uh, he looked forward to the next 30 years in terms of meteorological developments and forecasting developments. And it was as if it was written in 2000, looking back the previous 30 years, so far sighted was it. Uh, one big uh, step forward in the 1960s was the uh, availability of uh, um, satellite pictures from American, American sources. Um, here's a couple of examples. This one over the Atlantic shows a, a very well wound up low, which was the remains of an older uh, tropical storm, giving a perfect fix on the depression center and uh, a good idea of where the main frontal zones were. And this is a picture during an anti summer anticyclone with uh, um, clear skies for many, but uh, extensive stratus over the North Sea. And this was a thunderstorm developing over uh, Scotland. So straight away, these products were able to give forecasters more faith in their analyses. It could be used to supplement the um, what surface data there was available and data from, for example, um, reconnaissance flights. Now, in the 1970s, um, infrared satellite imagery came along. Here's an example from 1974. Um, it had the advantage, obviously, of showing the uh, uh, cloud top temperatures, therefore the height of the cloud. And also it was available 24 hours a day. So here's a nicely defined uh, um, broad frontal zone. British Isles showing up in the warm spring sunshine and a lot of detail within the cold air mass. So satellite pictures uh, represented a major step uh, forward with the bird's eye view. During the 1960s, um, uh, um, modelling, the an, a 10 level model was being uh, devised by Bushby and uh, Timpson amongst others. And um, this was to be have a 100 kilometre resolution for the finer uh, mesh version. And um, this also, the big step forward was this include moist processes and baroclinic processes. Here's some examples of output from that model from uh, reproduced from a paper by Peter Wickham. On the left hand side is the forecast pressure field and the symbols represent precipitation. And uh, here's the verifying analysis so for the 36 hour forecast. And uh, well, this example was um, a very was a very successful forecast, in fact. Um, having many, the, the quality was still variable. But um, according to Colin Flood, who was a senior forecaster in the uh, central forecasting office um, in those days, he said that gradually the models did achieve acceptance. And by the late 1970s, the so-called man-machine mix was accepted as the best forecast. But nevertheless, there were still major errors from time to time. And indeed, forecasts could still go horribly wrong, even in the 24 hour period, which is kind of difficult to imagine with the accuracy of today's forecasts. Um, and in addition, uh, because of an, uh, it was still often difficult to get to achieve a correct analysis uh, when comparing, say, with the satellite pictures available, uh, manual intervention so-called bogusing was carried out in order to correct areas where the model analysis was poor. And indeed, this process of intervention lasted into the 20th century. Uh, but with the model still being only 100 kilometers, it meant that uh, even though it had convective parameterizations, it couldn't represent smaller scale features really, such as polar lows, and indeed the shower clusters and low cloud and fog. So the forecast, especially at a local level, um, had a lot to add. 
This gives a context of what a forecasting office would look like in the 1970s. This is from the big for main forecasting office at Heathrow. Here we can see forecasters working at uh, light tables. Um, the senior forecaster in the distance there and the upper air forecaster um, uh, over there and lots of charts of model output and satellite pictures sort of hanging up there. And this was the outstation bench, the one in fact I worked at in uh, in 1980. Oh, and there's a, a visual display unit, yes. And here's the comms room with uh, teleprinters and uh, fax machines there. Uh, so it gives a flavour of what it's like. Um, I hope I've attributed these to the right um, uh, people in, in, in this uh, in this picture. Um, 19, uh, late 1970s, a huge step forward. Uh, Meteosat, geostationary imagery became available via from UMETSAT. And uh, these pictures were every half hour in infrared and visible. And so we were straight away able to see how systems moved, how they waxed and waned um, and developed. And you could see, uh, for example, rapid, you know, rapidly developing thunderstorms. Uh, um, so it was a it was a marvelous way of visualizing the atmosphere and making you reinforcing that the atmosphere wasn't just a cardboard cutout. It was a fluid. Um, so it gave a, a really good new window on how weather systems behaved. Now, into the 1970s, uh, one notable uh, um, catastrophe was the uh, Fastnet yacht race. Uh, this uh, um, uh, biennial yacht race took place in the sea areas Fastnet, just to the southwest of the uh, UK. And in this, um, a, um, a severe storm, windstorm with mountainous seas resulted in tragically 15 fatalities amongst the yachtsmen. Now, in the run-up to the event, uh, this is oh, this is the analysis showing unseasonably deep depression off Southwest Ireland and extreme gradients for the time of year moving over Fastnet. In the three days beforehand, models had been quite uh, erratic, but this is a man-machine mix forecast chart valid at the time of the Fastnet storm, a three-day forecast, which indeed indicated uh, um, windy weather, uh, disturbed weather coming into the Southwest approaches. And this forecast had actually deepened the low relative to the model. But as I've said, the forecasts were quite erratic from the model and the um, raw model forecast 24 hours beforehand just showed uh, a slack trough. In other words, massively in error. Um, the forecast, the modified version did produce a much more developed wave uh, for that time, but it was nothing like what turned out. And so the messages, well, some of the messages were that the most recent forecast model run isn't always the best. And indeed, that's even the case to the, today. But there were serious deficiencies in the uh, NWP suites of the time. But um, help was at hand, help was at hand in the respect of a new 15 level model that was being trialled during the 1970s. And this model, which had a high resolution version of 75 kilometres, horizontally, um, had physical parameterizations and data assimilation based partly on the results of big field exercises such as Figgy and Gate during the 1970s. And in this case, here's the uh, the operational 10 level model at the time, a three day forecast showing a ridge disappearing slowly eastwards from the UK. But the uh, new model, trial new model, instead of having this low near Iceland, brought it into northwest Scotland with um, implied very strong winds, uh, gales were about to come into the UK, very different. And here's the uh, verifying analysis, which has showed how uh, good in this case that new model actually formulation was. So it was an exciting potential for stepwise improvement in models guidance for cyclogenesis. And indeed, when it was introduced um, in 1982, um, it very quickly was able to show it produced lows of 9935 hectopascals and, uh, you know, people's jaws dropped when they saw a model coming up with lows of that magnitude, which did prove correct. However, there was still plenty of room for the added value. Um, here's an example of the fine mesh forecast at the time, the 75 kilometre version. 
And this 24 hour forecast, the isobars indicated and the thermal pattern indicated an active wave running across southern Britain, bringing wind and rain, but being replaced by cold, showery weather from the north. But in this particular incident, the senior forecaster was suspicious because there was a very sharp upper, upper trough behind this wave and the model still had a tendency to underdevelop waves. So the man-machine mixed forecast produced a more developed low, implying much more widespread wind and rain. And indeed, the verifying analysis showed that that was the case, if not even more so. So um, the message is that, uh, you know, ma uh, that although the synoptic scales were much better predicted than previous versions of the model, there's much room for the man-machine mix. And indeed, um, the local forecasters still had a lot to add. Now, with that in mind, um, weather uh, radar invented during the um, uh, developed during the Second World War. It was soon discovered by forecasters to be very useful for spotting rainfall pattern, which was just dismissed as clutter by the uh, um, air traffic control controllers, but uh, for forecasters, being able to see the rain was very useful. And at a lot of airfields which had the radars, it was able to, the forecasters could use it to spot showers and thunderstorms and other hazards. Now in the 1960s, Tony Harold um, uh, 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 produced work that showed that you could make quantitative estimates of rainfall from radar images. And uh, during the 1970s, under Keith Browning, uh, a project was led to uh, uh, which culminated in the networking of um, radars um, across the uh, initially across parts of across England and Wales. And here's an example of some uh, early pre -op uh, operational products that were a uh, result of the work done at uh, the Royal Radar Establishment under Browning and co workers. In this example, you can see broad rain band associated with a cold front moving east, but this very narrow band of line convection highlighted by these purple and red colours um, uh, developing associated with the cold front. So images like this, as well as giving very useful mesoscale detail, including rainfall intensities, could be used by local forecasters to infer areas of uh, a very poor bad deteriorations in cloud visibility and gusty winds. And also such products were very timely, being received, you know, only uh, with a delay of only 15 minutes to 15 to 30 minutes. Whereas, of course, many synoptic, synoptic observations were slower to become available and then another delay in drawing the chart. So such inform timely information was very useful for um, local forecasting. And there were very nice examples presented of um, of thunderstorms on the radar imagery. So um, a very a very big step forward. Uh, at the same time, work going on at Malvern under Browning and Harold, for example, um, devised uh, so-called conceptual models of uh, frontal systems, which would relate cloud patterns on imagery to precipitation patterns by means of uh, the uh, so-called slantwise warm ascending warm conveyor belts and how these ascended with relation to the uh, uh, with relation to the surface fronts would determine would have a big determining effect on what the rainfall distribution was uh, like associated with the fronts and um, and there were so a lot of different conceptual models were developed um, for example this of classical front and split fronts, each of which had their own characteristic rainfall patterns. And correct recognition of these frontal archetypes would enable forecasters to infer mesoscale rainfall details that, for example, wouldn't have been reproduced, uh, would have been below the resolution of the models at the time. And if used in conjunction with the radar pictures, could help explain away uh, some of the complexities that were observed and identify areas, for example, ripe for potential instability and assist greatly with um, local forecasting. Um, and uh, so in, in terms of local forecasting, um, I guess I'll, I'll mention more about that later, but um, no talk about, no talk on history of weather forecasting would be complete without mentioning 
mention of the famous Great Storm of 1987. Now, this event had a profound impact on forecasting practice. Um, uh, just a relatively minor error in the track and intensification of a cyclonic storm had major ramifications for uh, southeast England. This system gave 100 knot gusts on the south coast and uh, 80 plus knot gusts in London area and caused massive damage. Now, um, in the subsequent inquiry after the storm, the Swinners and Dye report, um, this led eventually to the um, revamping of the severe weather warnings in the UK and the establishment of the National Severe Weather Warning Service. Uh, more about that um, presently. It led to increased investment in NWP and observations. It led to an increased awareness of uncertainties in forecasts and warnings, and also increased awareness of wind-related impacts, which I think had sort of almost drifted a bit in the uh, previous few years. And um, also the importance of certain satellite signatures, namely the uh, cloud head, which uh, often precedes explosive cyclogenesis. And um, also uh, later research showed, connected with the Great Storm, showed the significance of the so-called sting jet, which is a mesoscale area of exceptionally strong damaging winds that often accompany explosive cyclogenesis. Uh, oh, here's a picture of what um, a cloud head actually looks like on the imagery, this particular configuration with a large anticyclonically curved poleward boundary, smooth cloud, dry wedge entering the system from upstream. And this particular cloud signature had been identified as, as, as characteristic uh, well back into the 1970s by Botka and co-workers uh, in, in Germany. But... Um, Awareness was increased of the importance of this as a result of the uh, the great storm. Now, um, the winter of um, in early 1990 produced a number of uh, severe wind storms across the uh, um, across the UK, and for the most part, these were uh, very well forecast. There was increasing awareness amongst the forecasting community of the broad synoptic and jet stream configurations that would lead to rapid cyclogenesis, the satellite imagery, plus of improvements in the models, and particularly the Burns Day storm of, well, exactly 30, 30 uh, two years ago today, timely warnings of widespread damage were uh, uh, were issued 24 hours in advance of the his system hitting southern England with uh, gusts in excess of uh, 80 knots. So, uh, and that was despite there having been a very erratic model performance in the run up to this and several of the other big events described by uh, Ewan McCallum in 1990. Now, um, importance of local forecasting. Um, with that in mind, uh, uh, the mesoscale model had been under development for the previous 10, 15 years um, in a group run by Brian Golding. And the mesoscale model became operational in the late 1980s with the resolution of about 15 kilometres, 16 levels. And bearing in mind, 15 kilometre resolution there is the same, is in fact coarser than the current generation of global models are now. So you can see in 30 odd years how much things have moved on. Um, but initially, the mesoscale model had human intervention to prescribe details, some details of the initial cloud patterns. And that later became automated in the what well, in the Nimrod system in the uh, 1990s. And this example shows a uh, mesoscale model forecast, a 12 hour forecast in a Spanish plume event uh, uh, in which uh, um, elevated instability was being drawn up from the uh, Spanish plateau. And the uh, model was forecasting uh, convection to be breaking out in a convergence zone over Sherberg. Now, forecasters are primed in this situation to look for rapidly developing convection. And this is where the Meteosat imagery of the time proved very useful. And this area of ex rapidly expanding cold tops was noticed in the mid afternoon, several hours before the model's predictions. And that, along with the rain area on the radar and lightning reports, 
was able to prompt issuing of severe weather warnings for southeast England for that uh, evening. So a nice example of how high resolution imagery and the mesoscale models um, could be used to assist um, forecaster. Workstation displays were also uh, moving on a pace. And this was an example from the Met Office uh, Horace display system in the very late 1990s and enabled forecasters to overlay observations, imagery, model products and make much easier the job of spotting when the model was going wrong, for instance. It is a rather nice example. Um, we can see a rather ragged looking cloud head. Uh, the yellow is a model for our forecast of sea level pressure. And um, the boy observation here, uh, the sequence showed that the pressure was something like eight millibars, eight HPA below background. And the automated um, on-screen analysis, um, was, which replicates essentially what a forecaster would draw with pencil and paper, um, indicated uh, a deep low just at the tip of the cloud head. And that in blue here, the uh, auto, auto analyzed isobars from using the OBS showed a much stronger gradient to the southwest of the UK. And in this case, uh, this was used to issue severe weather warnings for the southwest of England for severe gales um, for a few hours uh, after that. So increasing workstation, increasing workstation uh, facility was um, proved very valuable for forecasters. In the early noughties, uh, geostationary satellite imagery, Meteosat, um, had some additional channels of which water vapor was one. And another very useful one was the 3.7 micron imagery. And this proved fantastically useful for identifying fog and low cloud at night, which of course the 10.7 micron imagery was generally unable to do. And so in this example, we can see um, uh, in red here, the fo uh, fo red, the fog and low cloud in this false color enhancement over the um, over, over uh, central and southeastern Britain. And this sort of imagery would be was very useful for determining which areas would be affected in the morning by fog and uh, doubtless of use to aviation forecasters and uh, uh, et cetera. So um, this was an example of a, a very useful um, product that came along on, on Meteosat second generation. Now, in the late 19, uh, uh, 1990s, one major innovation was uh, the so-called field, modifi uh, field modification, also known as Metmorph, developed by Eddie Carroll at the Met Office. And this enabled direct manipulation of model output. Um, so it was thereby possible to correct for known model characteristics and for um, perceived errors in a model evolution. So those could be corrected directly. And it was used as a means of providing consistent graphical guidance to outstations and other customers using a newly developed uh, um, technology. And so it's possible to modify, um, so for example, sea level pressure, wind, cloud and precipitation. So here's a, a nice example of how this software could be used. In this instance, the 36 hour model forecast was showing a low translating up the English Channel to be over the low countries um, 36 hours later as a relatively weak feature. But uh, in this occasion, um, other model products and satellite imagery indicated that this low would probably be much more developed. And so the modified fields adjusted it to be much deeper and over centered over southern England. And the clever thing about this metamorph is that the modifications are done um, using um, potential vorticity um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an in, in, as an internal tool. So it uses potential vorticity and that maintains the kind of meteorological vertical integrity of the fields. And with the gradients being increased, the wind field was automatically adjusted to that. And in for the precipitation, precipitation had to be changed manually, but in the modified forecast, it could be redrawn to look more consistent with the idea of a developing low pressure. And 
this modified the modified fields are then used to populate the standard forecast charts that uh, many of you will, will have seen. And in this instance, the low did deepen markedly, but it was slightly further west. But the field modification proves a very valuable, useful tool for providing guidance. And um, talking, uh, talking of which, um, the graphical guidance is now was uh, developed, for, uh, initiated in the Met Office in the early noughties, I think it was. Previous to that, guidance was produced as a mix of the forecast charts and text messages, which would uh, uh, text uh, bulletins, which would describe the weather and um, how the models, some of which are available to the outstations, how they were behaving and whether which part aspects could be ignored. But with the availability of graphical guidance, um, that could be basically a picture tells a thousand words. And so it was then possible to produce the preferred story in the form of outputs that mimicked satellite and radar pictures. The forecast rainfall here presented in the radar rainfall intensity colours and cloud modified to, for example, here look convective in appearance. Uh, so these were produced out to 48 hours ahead initially and then um, for the medium range period. And when relevant, uh, rain snow discrimination could also be uh, included in, in the graphics. So a very powerful way of getting producing a consistent story for use by customers. In the 1990s, uh, a huge step forward was the availability of ensembles from the ECMWF model suite. And these became quickly incorporated into medium range forecasting at the Met Office. Now, of course, ensembles, basic, the basic concept is that you take a control run of the model and perturb the initial state uh, slightly to replicate uncertainties in the initial state. And uh, with time, um, in uncertainties also in the model's physical parameterizations. And then the model is run, you know, 30, 40, and now 50 odd times from the uh, uh, different, different starting conditions. And so it's a very good way of assessing confidence and uncertainty in the forecasts, spotting evolutions alternative to the main deterministic runs, and objectively assessing probabilities and also producing um, likely sequences of weather parameters for individual locations and the spread of uh, possibilities, for example, as in meteograms. And much later came um, feature tracking. So um, feature tracking software can pick up uh, the movement of individual centers and the, and the ensemble members. And this one was for the uh, Hurricane Ophelia, which hit Southern Ireland in 2017, October. And this shows a very graph visually striking way, the spread of possible storm tracks. Now, ensembles were one of several tools used in the forecasting of the Midlands floods in July 2007. This caused severe flooding along the Thames and Severn, for example. And this output from the Met Office regional ensemble, MOGREPS, uh, um, you can see the 24-hour forecast rainfall totals two to three days in advance, and the pale the cyan is 70 to 100 millimetres. And you can see how each of these, many of these postage stamps do have that amount of rain on it. And the derived probability forecasts showed the greatest probs of um, heavy, of widespread heavy rain over the central and southwestern parts of the UK. And this together with other ensemble products and um, deterministic models um, helped in the issue of the early warning uh, for the UK uh, for this particular event, indicating peak probabilities of disruption over the southwest Midlands. I remember coming on duty on this morning and, uh, and just being, a, it, it, it was incredible just seeing the um, 17 kilometre model producing well over 100 millimetres of rain in 24 hours over the part of the Welsh borders and uh, and the Midlands, um, you know, thinking, could it get any worse than that? Um, and in, in fact, it verified very well that the uh, larger areas had over 100 millimetres of rain on that um, on that day. Now, um, it was actually very well 
forecast in terms of rainfall. But in the ensuing inquiry by Sir Michael Pitt, um, this led to the uh, flood in the establishment of the Flood Forecasting Centre, a Met Office Environment Agency partnership. And this was designed specifically to um, link Met Office rainfall forecasts to the hydrological aspects that were the purview of the Environment Agency, in particular the flooding impacts, river and surface water. And since then, we've had a very, Met Office has had a very close partnership with the Environment Agency. And of course, the emphasis on impacts then um, fed into the revamping of the National Severe Weather Warning Service um, in 2011. Um, now you'll remember the NSWWS was established in the wake of the 1987 Great Storm. And in this revamped version, it was impacts that were assessed rather than weather thresholds. So the information was uh, summarised in this uh, um, warning matrix, which on the one axis, which is a combination of likely likelihood of the event and impact, and the position on the box indicated to the response emergency response community uh, to communicate the likely actions to be taken, taking into account hydrological and local knowledge, for example. Now, how was disruption assessed? Well basically through knowledge of and comparison with past events, for example, an analog type approach um, and return periods. And in essence, an example could be that, for example, 70 mile an hour gusts are much less frequent, but much more damaging in Birmingham or London than in northwest Scotland because of differences in local sensitivities and resilience. And the uh, Guidance unit forecasters had regular discussions with the Met Office civil contingencies advisors around the country who, who are aware of the local sensitivities, have a hotline to the local response community to advise on um, the like, what sort of warning criteria, what sort of uh, warning severity is required. And also have mentioned the input from the, the Flood Forecasting Centre and also uh, in embedded advisors and there's also now objective model guidance um, about likely impacts. So um, impact based forecasting has now really become dominant in the last um, um, last 10 years or so. Uh, very high resolution models um, such as the 1.5 kilometre model um, UKV um, have a, are a very important uh, tool in assessing the likelihood of, of severe weather. Um, this this example from January 2012 shows uh, uh, a, a very deep, vigorous low approaching Scotland. And at this resolution, it can show things like the line convection as well along a front, it can show areas of orographic rainfall. But in this case, there were exceptionally strong gradients forecast coming into Western Scotland. And indeed, the, um, um, the uh, gust diagnostic from this model run indicated a possible sting jet formation with uh, um, gusts over 40 metres per second, 80 knots being implied. And it was this particular, these types of products that uh, assisted the issuing of, of warnings for Scotland from the previous day. And observations early that morning from Isla in North, in uh, in, in, um, in Scotland, Isla, of gusts over 80, prompted the warning to be upgraded to red for the uh, um, morning rush hour period for central Scotland. And in fact, widespread disruption occurred with gusts of 70 to 80 knots occurring. So um, a combination of models and looking at observations enabled, uh, um, you know, uh, monitoring and upgrading of the warnings in this case. Um, high resolution models are also very good, useful for forecasting local weather, such as visibility. Um, now, this in this case, two of the operational high resolution models, the UK four kilometre and the one and a half kilometre, um, valid at the same time for a morning period. Um, now, the red and the purple indicate areas of, for, of dense fog less than 
100 metres visibility. But the two models give very different answers, one showing next to none over southern Ing Midlands, this showing widespread fog. So which is the forecaster to, be, to believe? So the forecaster must use the knowledge of the model characteristics and other factors, perhaps such as um, the such as the um, what, what's the model's cloud cover like? Is it correct? Um, to, in order to determine what the likely outcome is, and knowledge of models' characteristics is something that forecasters tend to build up, and this sort of information can be fed back to modelers in a dialogue to uh, um, to develop, you know, to improve models and to uh, try and correct for. Um, known um, problems. So quite a fruitful dialogue has developed in recent years. Um, forecasters must also be able to spot models going wrong. Even mod high resolution models now can go quite badly astray in the first few hours. For example, this radar picture shows a large area of rain um, in a cold frontal situation that wasn't present in the um, in the existing model forecast. And so straight away, manual adjustments have to be made to the forecast to determine how that's going to influence the subsequent evolution. Now, in order to highlight current forecasting capability at its best, here's the famous so-called beast from the east in early 2018, which gave severe disruptive snow over many parts of the country in exceptional cold. Now, the first Warnings for disruptive snow were issued by the Met Office uh, five days in advance and other products were then available, um, such now available, such as the um, high resolution ensembles with, I think, a 2.2 kilometer resolution. And in this case, we can see the high resolution ensemble highlighting the initial um, heavy snow event in the northeast of, of Britain associated with a very cold easterly then affecting another event affecting the southwest and Ireland as a frontal system approached from the south. Here it is um, coming up again. And this, along with other high resolution products, enabled the issue of um, <coughs> an amber and red warnings for uh, severe disruptive snow over southwest England and Wales. And significantly, um, the model products were able to imply show that freezing rain was an, uh, a very high likelihood in the southwest as warm air overran from the south. And I believe that just would not have been possible 15 years ago to get that sort of accuracy, uh, you know, um, in, in terms of forecasting. So things have moved on amazingly. And I think the very what seemed a very successful wind forecast for Storm Arwen in December, I don't believe those would have been achievable um, even just 10 or 15 years ago. To take account of the fact that high resolution models are still quite uh, variable in their handling of deep convection, um, experiment, uh, the um, operations centre in Exeter now um, does experimental now casting guidance for severe con summer convection. And um, is the team of specialist forecasters are available when um, the situation demands um, to be a, who have knowledge of how st of storm dynamics to um, produce these tailored forecasts for um, experimental tailored forecasts for emergency response community and as well as using ordinary synoptic data and radar data and high resolution models they use crowdsourced data and Doppler radar and come up with favored areas for um, effect to be effect impacted by severe convection and these products are then used to inform the National Severe Weather Warning products. So this example from last July um, shows a short period warning that went out with some severe thunderstorms that affected East Anglia and the southeast with flooding and hail and uh, frequent lightning. Um, own, uh, without being too self-indulgent, here it takes us up to date in terms of what a modern forecasting office actually uh, looks like. Um, um, notice in this 1990 picture, the early the CRT monitors, magnetic displays, and much more recently, video walls and m massive works, uh, multi-screen workstations. So the major changes to the forecaster's role since the pre-computer era, basically at that stage, in those days, forecasts were created from a blank sheet 
using the forecasters, uh, using observations and forecasters knowledge of how past similar events panned out and forecasts were communicated to the customer um, there, thereafter, whether it was the uh, public, the, um, the military or um, agriculture, marine, for example. And then by an incremental process, um, the forecasting became very much NWP and IT driven. And so one of the real skills was knowing where to find the information, the forecaster selecting the relevant information from a vast swathe of now model products and observational data, interpreting it, evaluating it, and the all important reality check. Does the model output look sensible? Does it fit with what we think should happen in a situation that the models are showing? Um, uh, how does it link to observations? Is the model forecast already going wrong? Or in terms of reality check, is it suggesting the right minimum temperatures, plausible minimum temperatures for the road customers? And a forecaster has to come quantify uncertainties. And for example, um, a forecast, um, uh, forecast impacts. So uh, for all of this, a very thorough um, uh, knowledge of applied meteorology is, is required. And you know to be able to communicate the feel of the weather. So it is all about adding value, let's say. And um, I would argue that the you know this these are the kind of qualities that a good forecaster requires. I've already mentioned the knowledge of applied meteorology, but I'll allow obviously you can have a look through this sort of list for yourselves. Um, but indeed, I think these are the same qualities that are required by a forecaster now as was required by the forecasters doing the predictions for D-Day, even though the working practices are very, very different. So these were the key developments that um, um, I've talked about. Uh, on the top, the main advances in Met Office um, NWP. Um, I, I, you know, there's lots of others which I'm sure people will point out things that are missing potentially. And down here are particular events that I think had a big impact on the um, on forecasting practice and all of this was underpinned by continuous improvements in computing telecommunications data assimilation and of course uh, workstation technology so i think uh, all of this has assisted the forecaster in uh, enabled the forecaster to work in a much more effective efficient and uh, smart manner so I'll now hand back to uh, Julian for the uh, questions and um, and answers. Excellent. Excellent. Thank, thank you very Thank you much very much indeed, indeed, uh, Martin. Martin. Um, um, OK, okay. Well, we do have a few uh, questions. We may have more to come in the in the uh, next few minutes. Uh, let's hope they don't flood in. But uh, first of all, congratulations for covering so much ground. I should say that first of all. Um, so um, looking at the questions that we that we have um, from Norman Liner, our former chairman, first of all. He got in first, so I'll, I'll do these in order. Um, the uh, he says NWP is um, very good today, um, but it isn't always translated into reliable forecasts. And then his final point is so we wonder what your reaction to this is. Um, is is the problem a trade off between precision and accuracy? Um, now we have this advantage that uh, everybody's microphone is muted and he may well be shouting at me at the moment but uh, what i think in response to that norman might be referring to is maybe when we go two or three days ahead um is there a danger perhaps of covering a bit too much um detail being too precise when inevitably the level of accuracy tails off to some extent so he's he's being he's making a, a critique perhaps of the maybe the way we can present model output in forecasts um what would you be what would be your take on that then precision and versus accuracy i think that's a very relevant point and i hope i was uh, tried to cover that in some uh, some respects but um to answer the um first point that uh, norman's made um Certainly, uh, the uh, the whole the job of the forecaster is to actually decide when the model isn't giving the correct 
story. And that's where experience still uh, comes in. It is much more difficult. There is a danger with model products becoming so good now that it may be very tempting to dot, follow the dot, so to speak, and not look critically at the information. So that's where obviously looking at observations is very, very important. And the all important reality check, does it actually look plausible? Um, stand back from the models, just have a look at the charts and from one's own experience, say, what would you expect to happen in this situation? Uh, the models won't tell you where the forecast's going to go wrong. Um, that's the, essentially a very human skill to know what the vulnerabilities are in a particular situation. And if I interpret it correctly, I think it's very important to be able to, this business of precision versus accuracy, that example I showed with the two high resolution model outputs of uh, one showing fog and one showing no fog, both are very, very precise, but one or both could have been horribly wrong uh, for, a, uh, for a customer. Um, and so I think for medium range forecasting, I think uh, obviously one has to look at the fact that precision, well, accuracy is going to decline as you go into the forecast period in most, but not all cases. And that's where the forecaster has to have the skill in interpreting the information, looking at the range of solutions using his or her own expertise and putting suitable wording and confidence levels in the in the forecast. For example, in some cases, you could be pretty certain about the timings of a rainfall event in a frontal situation three days, four days away. You can be confident up to even two or three hours. But, you know, in a thundery situation, a Spanish plume, you could be completely wrong two hours in advance. You know it's going to be thundery, probably, mm -hmm. but you can be disastrously wrong in terms of the position. So I think it is it is a trade-off. And I think we've not got to get too complacent about forecasts, about uh, models, and to know where they are likely to go wrong, especially in things like convection and uh, fog, even in the short term. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you, you made one very specific point about forecasters have to remember that the, the latest model run is not always the most accurate, even though it's human nature to think that it that it would be, but it but it isn't always, is it? Um, and okay. that's where you have to have the continuity of looking over several, you know, several consecutive model runs and being able to present the information in a way that's user friendly from that point of view. Lovely, thank you. Um, question uh, from Len, quite a specific one. It's about the uh, Met Office's veri verification web page, um, which was issued for 24 hours ahead for particular locations, but it has been withdrawn. Um, and was there a particular reason for that? I don't know uh, when that took place. Unfortunately, I can't answer that since I since I did retire from the Met Office a year ago. So it would be useful if there are any Met Off, current Met Office people listening in, perhaps they could give some insight or who to contact uh, for that question. OK, great. Um, my former boss, Paul McKnightley, comments that low cloud and fog still prove challenging to this day and indeed this week, I suspect. Well, um, that, that's not a question, but but I dare say lots of people will agree with that. Um, and then um, we have a question here from David Schultz. Um, great talk, Martin. Um, what's the biggest forecasting challenge that Met Office forecasters face? OK, there's a number of them um, in the very in the um, one of the big challenges let in a bigger picture is the amount of products to actually look at in the time available. So just even mentally assimilating the information and separating out, let's say, the signal from the noise. What is what is the key information of the day? Getting into more specifics, um, for example, mesoscale phenomena. I've already mentioned things like um, deep convection and uh, low cloud, um, especially elevated instability is a, a major forecasting problem. Um, things like rain to snow transition, which was a huge problem, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We are much better at that now, but that can still be quite a nerve wracking, um, you know, quite a nerve wracking sort of uh, feature uh, to consider. And 
I suppose the main problem, I haven't talked, I've confined myself to short and medium range forecasting, but, you know, producing forecast for, say, kind of more than 10 days ahead into a month ahead is still very much a, um, a problem, but it's obviously being looked at much more by the monthly and seasonal forecasting people. But that's kind of somewhat out with my area of of um, expert of, of expertise and, you know, problems in just um, things like doing severe weather warnings, uh, getting the emphasis just right, um, mm -hmm. knowing that, uh, you know, you've got to, um, you know, you've got to try and get 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 the message over, get the right balance between um, uh, getting the right balance, and also in the situations where you're a long way ahead of the of the event, uh, we're now much more hostage to fortune if the models start backing off an event as you get as you get nearer. So when you could originally only forecast 24 hours ahead, that wasn't an issue, but now that we can see often se severe systems, severe weather five six days ahead. How do you actually manage the messaging as you go from, say, uh, an event that's five days away to potentially, mm -hmm. you know, backing off the severity as you get nearer the time? How do you keep the messaging up to date and prevent the media juggernaut running away with sensation? And, and also dealing with all the massive variety of weather information that's out there, um, you know, keeping the message consistent when the media will have their own um, lines to take on things that need, you know, in order to help sell newspapers. So trying to curb it, trying to sort of rein in the sensation. Um, so it's a number of factors um, yeah. sort of take your pick, really. OK, lovely. Um, there's a fascinating question from Dan Harris here. Could you emulate Sir John Mason and pontificate on what the next 30 years might hold for operational forecasting? Uh, well, one of my sort of uh, things that I've really sort of come come to the conclusion is quite a big risk in forecasting is that I think we need to retain uh, people's traditional, inverted commas, traditional forecasting skills, because um, although we're obviously going, we've, we've reached a kind of almost a law of diminishing returns for some sorts of, uh, um, in many aspects, in terms of synoptic scale systems, more resources need to put in just to get minor improvements. But I would like to think there'd be significant improvements in the uh, in handling boundary layer features, such as what we talk about low cloud and convection. Um, but one thing we need to bear in mind is we're very, very dependent on the satellite network working. And I think we'd be very vulnerable if due to um, space debris, um, space weather event, a solar flare or uh, hostile action. If we were to lose a lot of the satellite network, we would have to, uh, you know, we'd suddenly might see a massive drop in our our range of our numerical forecasting skill. So it may be then that we'd have to, you know, be much more aware of techniques for looking for when models are going to go wrong. In other words, human skills would actually looking at the data, comparing it with perhaps model runs that aren't going to be as good because of data being deprived by loss of, say, a satellite network, we'd have to, re we'd have to perhaps keep in, in our background, keep resurrected the traditional forecasting skills. Um, so, yes, it's, I think it's, it's very difficult. There won't be anywhere near the massive uh, improvements that we've seen in the last 30 years, but I would like to think maybe we see big Im we'll see improvements in uh, the Holy Grail, will be whole improvements in monthly forecasting and seasonal forecasting. And it'd be really, and I suspect I would hopefully see improvements in the sort of 10 to 30 day forecasts, which uh, because forecast accuracy seems to drop off quite markedly in uh, once you get beyond about day 10. OK, lovely. Um, the, at least two more questions it would be great to cover. So we'll just keep a bit of an eye on, on the time. Uh, one from Bryony May. Um, great talk, Martin. What are the main challenges for a forecaster of moving from threshold based to impact based severe weather warnings? Um, it's a kind of almost like a mindset. Um, it's a mindset thing. Um, I mean, in terms of thinking, one of the problems is that uh, um, the in, very, in, very, in terms of in terms of impacts, 
um, it's always difficult to assess the impact because, of course, the forecast itself will influence the way people behave and then result in perhaps fewer impacts than the situation would have had if the forecasts weren't available. So um, there's always a difficulty in assessing um, in, in, in the future, looking at the event and deciding how many impact it caused and using that as a template to uh, measure future events by. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that you can be, say, if you had, say, 70%, if you were 70% accuracy in forecasting your weather threshold, but any, in, and that you only had, say, a 70 or 60% effectiveness in forecasting uh, uh, impacts, then, of course, the end forecast might be, you know, have a, have a less than 50% chance of actually being correct because you're compounding the uncertainties of a forecast with the uncertainties of the impacts. So you're kind of a bit hostage to fortune, perhaps, um, because you're trying to assess, you're trying to forecast two different things. Um, but I think a lot of it was initially a kind of a mindset shift. And um, in a way, having the knowledge about how um, the weather does impact on different areas in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, and it's very much a learning process that I think after some major blizzards we had in, I think, 2013, um, it was before that it was thought, well, rural areas aren't affected nearly as badly by blizzards as um, as urban areas are. But then the wake up call was when there were some very severe blizzards in about 2013 in rural southwest Scotland and areas were cut off for days and days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it was all a kind of a learning process. Um, but it's a much more complex process to consider, as I remember from the quite animated discussions we would have between the op centre forecasters and the uh, civil contingencies advisors. So it highlighted complexities. But I think um, in the end, you know, the impact forecasting has definitely been the way to uh, to go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I dare say we could have a whole meeting on that. that oh, question. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, m moving on. Um, uh, Ewan asks about the man machine mix. Um, it's clear that the machine has been very successful in recent years, he says. Um, how do you see the man machine mix changing symbiotically over the next 20 years? These are quite big questions, aren't they? But uh... Well, my initial thought is that probably most of the changing has taken place during the uh, last um, last 20 or 30 years from a situation where we where major synoptic modifications are made in the you know, 1970s and the 80s to now where very rarely do synoptic modifications get made until you get sort of, you know, four or five days ahead when the uncertainties kick off. Um, I mean, I would think there'd be more and more in the way of um, automated um, products going out in the way that they are um, now. I mean, the other man machine mix more and more now we're producing graphical products. Um, um, I, I didn't show many of them. I showed the obviously the war, the warnings uh, maps, but also there's a lot of graphical products now produced for particularly like government customers, which show probability risk maps. So it may well be um, um, more in the way of uh, graphical products for specific customers, such as uh, also products that are produced for things like the European sort of Aristotle project now, which looks at severe weather over uh, on a much more global scale. So I think the actual model output will probably require less and less in the way of uh, modification um, mm -hmm. as the products, uh, products improve. And it's more looking at tailored products you know, for different um, different customer groups, but still keeping an awareness that the forecaster might have to dive in at an early stage in the forecast and modify it um, is, you know, when there's observations show things going wrong. But it's always going to be difficult because of the fact there's a lot of automated products go out unchecked. And um, so I think a lot of it is about more tailored products for uh, specific customers. OK. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know if you've got the um, questions open, but just comments from uh, two or three people uh, at the end. Uh, William Taylor, bringing back memory, hap mem many happy memories of wrestling with the various model outputs. 
Mike Dutton says, thank you, Martin, brought back memories of my time as a chief forecaster um, and you overlapped. And Norman Liner, again, um, remembering the pencil and rubber weather forecasting era and, and like you saying how invaluable those skills are. So um, there we are. I think that wraps things up and I'm conscious of the time. So if I may, just to end the evening, um, I don't know if you want to say anything finally, Martin, but I think we should say on behalf of the history group and um, the society, thank you very much for packing so much information in. And I just have one, uh, well, two slides to uh, end with, and I just need to get um, into the correct set of slides. This won't take very long, so as quickly as I can, let's go into the two closing slides and hopefully you can all see these and here we have got uh, news of two upcoming meetings the first one is uh, coming up very soon now um, one of our committee members chris folland who is with us tonight he is um, going to be chairing this meeting um, the national meeting on um, the history of climate science ideas and their applications which is actually going to be an in-person meeting as well as being available um, on a streamed format and then next year a quick early plug um, as the, the history group celebrates its 40th anniversary we're hoping to run a meeting on data rescue citizen science and the extension of climatic records and if there are any expressions of interest there um, do please let me know. I would love to hear from you. Um, and just uh, in, on the subject of keeping in touch, finally, uh, as well as the YouTube channel um, of the Society um, and the archiving of events, so this recording will be available uh, on the archive soon. Um, even the History Group now has caught up with the 21st century with Facebook and Twitter sites uh, available and the email address that I've mentioned. So there we go. Um, I shall close now by saying thank you once again, um, uh, Martin, for a very uh, interesting meeting. And we look forward to any, any further papers you are going to be uh, writing in your retirement. OK, um, and I think um, I think that's about it on the questions side and uh, many thanks uh, from all of us once again. So, OK, thank you very much. So if everybody's happy with that, with no late questions, I will close the meeting if that's OK. Thank you, Martin. OK, thanks, Julian. OK, then. Thanks very much. Bye bye, yeah. everybody. Bye -bye.